My apologies. As soon as we have a board uh, quorum of the board, we'll get started. I apologize for the late start. Thank you. We have a, a quorum of the board, so I'd like to get started. Um, can I have a motion to um, reopen from closed session for the charter application work session? Motion by Commissioner Chinia. Can I have a second? Second by Commissioner Bondima. All in favor? Uh, Commissioners McFadden, Bondima, Kashani, Chinia, Berkeley approve. Uh, five in favor, four absent. Um, people will join us as they come, so we're going to get started. Um, I'd like to um, start by welcoming, um, welcoming everybody to this session. Um, and thank you to the people who have put so much time and effort into the application process. Um, we know how, hard, how, how big of a task this is to work on uh, pulling your ideas and concepts and partners together in, uh, to bring your ideas forward for the, in support of uh, city schools children. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, uh, and I, this should be obvious given the nature of our portfolio, that this is a district that uh, very much values charter schools. And we, we continue to believe uh, they're a very important part of our overall portfolio and the options that we provide for kids. Um, so with that said, um, we're going to have a brief introduction from uh, uh, Ms. Alvarez. And then we're going to um, hear from each charter. The process today is to have a brief presentation from each of the charter school charter applicants. Um, each applicant will have a four-minute presentation followed by a Q&A from the board. Um, at the conclusion of this session, we'll adjourn this session and then reopen for the public board meeting. And um, the formal vote on the uh, charter applications will be at the next board meeting, which is on June 12th. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Alvarez. So uh, good evening, um, Board of Commissioners and Dr. Santelisis. I'm Angela Alvarez. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. Um, so uh, today's work session is your opportunity to hear um, from um, applicants who are applying to open uh, new charter schools. Um, we formally um, shared um, uh, a little bit about each of the applications at our last, at the last regularly scheduled board meeting on May 8th. Um, this is the opportunity for the applicants to speak directly to the board and for the board to ask direct questions of the applicants. Um, and then uh, on June 12th is when the board will make its uh, final determination uh, around um, uh, each of the applications. Um, so I'm gonna uh, go ahead so that most of the time is um, actually spent hearing from applicants and not me and um, call up the first school. Um, oh, okay, great, uh, the presentation is coming up. Perfect. Um, so if I, if we can have um, Northworld Apol Community Academy, who's applying to open the Ames Sandtown Freedom and Democracy Academy, um, come on up so they can um, actually introduce this, their schools, uh, more about their schools and uh, take questions. Good afternoon. Uh, commissioners, we appreciate the opportunity to share with you all. Uh, thank you, Ms. Alvarez, uh, Mr. Roberts. Um, it, our instructions were to share with you our vision and then to receive questions. And um, uh, we'd like to pass these out quickly, if you'd each take one. What you have there is just two pages, and then there's a, set, a third page uh, that, that uh, we may, may or may not need. So I'll start. 
it, 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 we'd just like to read from our executive uh, summary. We think that's the best way maybe to proceed. I'm convinced that the story of the black-led struggle to expand American democracy is a grand opportunity for us to learn and teach what we have already known at levels far beyond words. When we search deeply enough into the struggles for truth, justice, and hope of any human community, moving with disciplined compassion and vision, we emerge from that uh, exploration with the lessons that were meant for all of us. In other words, when approaching the movement from this perspective, what we realize is that the story of the African American struggle for freedom, democracy, and transformation is a great continuing human classic whose liberating lessons are available to all seekers and discoverers, but especially to those who understand that the battle is still in their own hands and hearts. So I look forward to the reemergence of our large-scale struggle for democracy, encouraged by teachers of wisdom and compassion, filled with participants of many colors, offering creative alternatives for the lives of us all. That's uh, Dr. Vincent Harding, Hope in History, Why We Must Share the Story of the Movement, um, 2009. And here from uh, Dr. Du Bois, of all the civil rights for which the world has struggled and fought for 5,000 years, the right to learn is undoubtedly the most fundamental. The freedom to learn has been brought by bitter sacrifice, and whatever we may think of the curtailment of other civil rights, we should fight to the last ditch to keep open the light to learn, the right to have examined in our schools not only what we believe, but what we do not believe, not only what our leaders say, but what the leaders of other groups, nations, and the leaders of other centuries have said. We must insist upon this to give our children the fairness of a start, which will equip them with such an array of facts and such an attitude toward truth that they can have a real chance to judge what the world is and what its greater minds have thought it might be. Again, Dr. Du Bois, the freedom to learn and, and, and there, thereafter. The words of Drs. Harding and Du Bois succinctly summarize the nature of the Ames Sandtown Freedman Democracy School public charter school being proposed in this application. They contextualize the mission, mission and vision that the local residents and founding leaders have identified based on the Sandtown community's needs to be transformed uh, from the economically disadvantaged, underemployed, under-resourced, and undereducated neighborhood that it is today into the thriving, uh, well-resourced, uh, socioeconomically uh, healthy, and well-educated community of infinite possibilities that envisions itself to be today and in the future. Despite efforts to the contrary, existing educational options in the neighborhood do not fully meet, provide, or protect our children's civil and human right to learn. And yet there is hope in an alternative method of schooling that includes pur purposeful instruction in elements that are syst systemically missing from traditional city schools that will meet and ensure these rights. We propose manifesting our vision of a school that helps our country move to ever higher levels of humanity by providing a rigorous exemplary college preparatory education that equips our students to participate effectively and constructively in the world as civic-minded servant leaders of today and tomorrow, preparing them for college and career so that they have the option to choose one or both. Our mission is to equip our students through superior academics and <coughs> excellent intellectual skills with advanced character traits that ensure their, abil their ability to make a living and a life. Our work includes traditional, rigorous subject matter, core knowledge sources, and NACA's unique transformative freedom and democracy curriculum. Our K-5 through constructivist, culturally, culturally relevant F&D model aligns with all <coughs> six of BCPS's goals and priorities by seeking to ensure all Ames Sandtown students achieve at the highest academic levels and demonstrate consistent growth every year as a result of the exemplary, exemplary project-based learning instruction and authentic performance assessments they receive from outstanding teachers in a safe and nurturing environment, supported by the collaborative efforts of engaged parents, community members, and community service organizations. We are confident in our plan's proven success and our capacity to implement our vision with fidelity based on the integ integral role played by our uh, invited collaborators, North Carolina <coughs> Community Academy, who already manages two successful charters. Dr. Gray? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So the, the, time to summarize, to, the time to summarize your plan has expired. That, so. that's, that's it. We, 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 we are the Freedom and Democracy Schools, and the children will learn a traditional curriculum, reading, writing, math, science, and all of that. Simultaneously, we will, we will constantly teaching them lessons of freedom and democracy so that they can navigate in the world as it is and build the world that, that we all desire. Okay. Um, I'd like to open it up for, thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I just want to, yeah, anyway. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions from the board. Commissioner Canham. Could you uh, speak more about your academic expectations for a student, uh, how we monitor um, student growth, uh, you know, what we do with students who are behind where they need to be, catch them up. Can you just talk a little bit more about the academic growth? Sure, academic growth, uh, it's, it's, the children have to move. What, what, what we've done thus far is we move the children as a group. You're going to have those superstars who are going to be moving anyway. And then you're going to have some children who learn differently who are going to need extra support. And then you're going to have that middle group uh, who, who, who need just the ongoing, uh, consistent uh, repetition. 
And, and that's how we're going to move the children. We're going to keep in front of them uh, sources that the school system uses and in other sources. Commissioner Hassan. Thank you so much, Dr. Reverend. Um, question about with this small size, opening size of 126 students, how you plan to be able to meet Comar minimum standards for arts, health, physical education, those, those kind of buckets? Well, we, we have that number there, and, and with your permission, we'd be glad to expand it. Uh, we, 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 we wanted to, to come in at a number that, that we uh, are confident in, but if there, you know, we would hope there would be no blockage or any prevention or any penalty if we look up and we have 226 or 252. So the question bears the, the same merit. Let's say you get to 500. Mm -hmm. How are you going to meet those needs? So, so, and it's, for, it's, for the Comar required regulations mm -hmm. for the arts experiences mm -hmm. and physical and health education at every grade level yes, to provide a teacher to do that on those sure. small numbers, how do you plan to be able to do that? Well, th those numbers are not so small. If, if, we're, if we're at 500, it, it's easy. It's, it's more difficult the, the smaller the enrollment. At 500, we will have the full-time uh, uh, special uh, education teacher, the full-time physical education teacher, the full-time arts teacher. We'll have those full-time uh, BCPSS vetted and, and uh, uh, connected uh, and credentialed persons in place to take care of those, those requirements. Okay, so giving your enrollment capacity cap at two, two, 296. Okay. That's, How does that, that happen then? How do you pair back and make sure that still happens? Right, right now we're, we're looking at facilities. Right now we're also, uh, tonight actually, we have, we have one of, uh, first of, of more meetings with the city. We, we, we went to a meeting, uh, we were invited to a meeting, uh, I think a week, week or two ago, with the city. They're getting rid of surplus buildings. And we intend to secure one or more of those buildings, and, and in which case we would uh, uh, submit an, an amendment because we would absolutely want to expand our numbers and we'd have the space to do it. So that my second, second bucket of questions is let around me, students with special needs. Let me say something yes, about yes, that. Absolutely. Good, evening. Good evening. It's good to be here among friends. I want to say that if the uh, enrollment increases to 500, we would have funds to provide the kind of education that we're looking for. If we're not uh, looked over or done away with in, without the money, we couldn't do it. And that's what we're working to do now with our partners. We're getting strong, very strong support from the Baltimore-Washington Conference. And we have other partners who are helping us around to get money to uh, put forth this. We have a grant from the federal government, first of all, and they will help us. And uh, we will do lots of things to advertise. We have engaged a um, person who is very good with media and will help us with advertisements to get funds from everywhere. So until you get beyond the 296 cap, you will not be able to meet those needs, is what you're saying? Correct? We'll meet the needs. We'll meet the yes. needs. Our we, curriculum, we, how? Well, we're going to do project-based learning, and we will raise scores because we have been used to raising scores. We have high scores. And we will do all kinds of things with children learning about themselves to build their self-esteem. As it was said in the beginning, that when children learn about their culture, they improve. You know the people, Ron Edmonds and all of these listed in here that I didn't want to repeat again, but there are people who have known for years that when children learn about themselves, they do better. Ma'am, can you, can you clarify the question? Because I, I, I don't want to be missing whatever Correct. is so, uh, inside Comar of the Comar regulates that every student has an arts experience yes. every year at every grade level. Yes. And Comar also regulates that every student has a health and physical education experience every year. Yes. So that's three additional teachers. Yes. And I'm curious, with an opening enrollment of 126 students, how you can possibly afford that? Well, again, oh, as... Oh. as, as and, and what we do is, yeah. I'm going to doctor and plot on team. And what we do, pardon me for staying, mm -hmm. what we do is this. Could you introduce yourself for the record so we know who you are? And I'm Reverend Dr. Napata, right? I've been at this board on different occasions when we did Afrocentric curriculum, you name it. I was at University of for 45 years. I got education in the military and the life. 
And I'm a community member, and I live in that community. The point I'm making is this is the 50th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. And the state of Brown still has not desegregated based upon a state junk injunction. I went to Douglas and to City. They were academies of excellence. So when you ask questions like, how do we intend to accomplish this? Use the terms like efficacy, every student can learn. We talk about everything from a design lesson objective. We talk about sit teams. We talk about devolving. We talk about rolling Patterson decentralizing the school system. And you ran him out of town. He made good in New York. He died. And you didn't even celebrate him. The point I'm making is this. Good people like yourself, who are charged by the state of Maryland and now the city to implement federal guidelines that says each child is entitled, whether they're at a charter school or non-charter school, non school, school, to learn. Every child can learn. Take the whole village to raise a child. Take the whole child to raise a village. I'm going to say that. I'm saying this. We asked the right meticulous questions. They threw me out of three schools in Baltimore City. They threw me out of Booker T, they threw me out of Lamel, and the like. And yet I have three doctorates. Because some white kid at the Board of Education on 25th Street, when they were trying to do these simple tests, asked me, he said, can I talk to him? And I didn't like him because the only white people I saw was white people collecting welfare checks or whatever, looking for a man under his bed. I've been around the world, and I'm rather bragging on myself, because a teacher I did not want at C.W. Coolidge's Taylor, who was chocolate, and I didn't like chocolate teachers. I wanted Maria Broom's mother, right, who was a, a, a radio reporter on TV. But what I'm saying is this. I'm saying if we are seriously committed, look around in the room. You see a community engaged, right? You see in that old Douglas. His church is right across the street from old Douglas. Who did not go to old Douglas? This is, this is old power. They became Calvin Education Center, right? We got hand-me-down schools. We marched from Old Douglas to Whip Hall, right? And at the end of the day, that school is still underfunded. I think we have I some... Stood with Nancy, I'm on the school list. I stood with Nancy Grassley in her office. Dr. When they wanted to close down <laughs> Douglas and, and Patterson at the same time, almost through, at the same time. And we joined in unity with Patterson to save those schools because we did a rally and we said we were academies of excellence. All I'm saying is you, you. you really feel us and hear us because we can argue statistics and pedagogies all day long. In the end, do you believe in urban education? That's the question. Because if you do, those same questions that you're asking about this charter school, ask of every other school where you have no art teacher. Ask for every other school that has no physical education teacher in Baltimore City. Ask for every private school carved out of the public school system like City. Like like Excuse me. Like we have we have a lot of pres we have a lot of presentation. Yes, we are. Under a microscope that you don't put other schools on. Because if you do, we will sue your class action suit, and I've done that in one. So just listen to us and be quiet. We are listening to you. That's why I'm, we're asking. That's I'm, why we're asking these questions. So. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. The Key is just a. Uh, is, no, it, it's okay. Uh, I want to make sure that we. I just wanted you to know to answer your question, we would, uh, to how we would be able to afford to hire the educate the uh, arts teachers. First of all, we have uh, other monies that are promised to come in through our uh, other resources, through our foundations that we work with at our own church. We also have uh, art teachers and we have musicians who are teachers, certified teachers, who are willing to come and do the work, even at 126 students. So the funding to raise those monies to afford those teachers is there. So that's to, to answer your question in the short term. They cannot do it perhaps off of per by the student-based budgeting formula. So that means that the church would also be one of those partners who would also fundraise to, to meet that need. Dr. DeKey is an avid member of our community, and he is very passionate about this school. He has been fighting for this for the last 20 years, before I even came on the scene. So we thank Dr. DeKey, and we, we appreciate his passion. Amen. Just, would like to, just, to, just to amplify, you, you do see the document from the federal government Again, we just want to reiterate for those who may not know, the federal government awarded 14, it was either 14 17. or 17, 17, 17, 17 across the country. Only 17 organizations, charter organizations in this country received one of those grants. We're one of those. That's a five-year grant. So right now, right now, we're, we already have, we have $300,000 right now. We've already started purchasing computers, books, other items for the students. In Sandtown, because that's what the grant calls for. So the grant is, that was one of my questions, because yes, um, typically th yes, these, uh, and this is just, I'm sure. going to ex expose the limit of my yes, knowledge in this. Yes, um, I thought that typically these grants were for the expansion of, of, an, of existing programming, uh, or the uh, NACA, NACA 1, and NACA that, 2. Well, the, well, that, that's but, it, the, but is this, sure. but, so this money is specifically able to be used for the Sandtown School? Absolutely. Yes. If, if, you, if you go to ed.gov, you will see our application. It's there. It's, it's unlike anything we've seen so far yet with the city and the state. 
The document is there. The markup is there. What we did well, what we need to, to be stronger on. It, and it's for replication and expansion. Expand NACA 1, expand NACA 2, replicate, build another in open, convert, open in Sandtown. The language is there. They, they understand about Sandtown. So we're, we're not talking theory. They're looking. Our, our project officer is ready to come. He's going to give us a minute. But they're ready to come and see the work at NACA 1, NACA 2, and Sandtown. It's in the document. Okay. I, yes, appreci I appreciate that. I'll, and I the will. document goes from September 27, 2017, five years out. So we are in process right now. Yes, ma'am. Very helpful. Other questions? Thank you, Dr. Gray. I don't think I heard how much the grant was for, the federal grant. It's, it's a little over 1.5. It's there in your document. It is. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. okay. Good. Thanks. It's a little over. It. It's a little over 300 a year, so it's 1.5 okay. something. I've got if you. I've got the whole 50-page document. If, if you want me to bring that back or email that over. Well, actually, it says what's authorized is 603. 603 is for the first two years. Although it's showing as the first year, we've been instructed. Okay, Only got spend it. Only spend 300 the first year. Got it. The next, so it's, it's really weird the way they set yeah, it out. My bad. But again, it's online, and we're, we'd really love to come and, and, and walk, walk, walk through the document with you. Got it. Thank you very much for that clarification. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? Thanks for taking the time. Appreciate Thank it. You. Madam Chairperson, can I acknowledge those members from the community yes, who sir. came? I'm going to ask those from the Sandtown community who took off of work or your children go to the school, if you all could please stand so they can see you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm from Sandtown. I was born there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, uh, CEO, Dr. Santa Maria, Chief Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Gray. Sure. Next, I'd like to invite Am I supposed to do this, Angela, or will you do it? BIA? I'd like to invite um, Baltimore International Academy West. You can leave them with, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. On it. Welcome. Uh, so you take the time to summarize and then we'll ask some questions. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, Madam CEO and distinguished commissioners and school leaders uh, for this opportunity to share our application with you. In the photos that will be coming around to you, I will take time to say what's in there because it's important for our success. We have in there the executive summary. I know you have it. Uh, the completed online survey, the international baccalaureate, uh, the blank survey for the community, international baccalaureate primary years program, the international baccalaureate brochure, and on the right side you have the what parents want to know about language immersion kindergarten educational target sheet. In our school, we send home expectations for, for our teacher, students and with, for the parents to know, be occurring with what's going on in the school. And um, we also have the, the kindergarten monthly lesson plan. We also have in there how we accommodate students with various learning needs. After many years of thoughtful consideration, we decided to replicate the city's, Baltimore City's only multilingual language immersion and international baccalaureate world school. In fact, city schools um, is the only district anywhere in the United States that can boast of having total immersion programs in all of the five or six official uh, United Nations languages, including English. Five foreign languages with English being the six official United Na Nations languages. This is a school that combines two unique educational models. These two models are innovative but yet proven and grounded in research. Our reason for replicating BIA is simply to expand access to quality educational programming to more of city school children, uh, Baltimore city children. 
Within the last decade, we have seen the lives of our children and their families change, literally change, as they are exposed to the world right here in Baltimore City. Replicating BIA will automatically increase city schools' primary years and um, middle years international baccalaureate program because as a replicated, uh, as a replication of a school that already exists that is an international baccalaureate school, this school will automatically become an international baccalaureate world school, only training teachers and sparing us the expensive fees that you pay to become international <laughs> baccalaureate schools and, and all of it that it takes. The replicated school will start in 2019 with pre-K and kindergarten and sixth grade concurrently and add a grade each year until both ends reach eighth grade. In fact, in 2007, we started um, the first BIA with uh, kindergarten and first grade in Chinese immersion and kindergarten and fifth grade in um, French immersion. Second to fifth grade are considered late immersion. Therefore, this organization, this school has experience in doing late immersion. Um, we've also have had late immersion recently with sixth graders that came from city schools and other private schools that did quite well, went on to enter into the best city school, uh, high schools and private schools, and they, are, they, could, they were able to be proficient at a level, level that would give them the seal of literacy. In short, we are saying that what we have already done in Baltimore City can be expanded so that more kids have this quality education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Commissioner Hassan? So how will you propose, or maybe how do you from your lessons learned, dealing and working with students with disabilities in this curriculum and in this program? So uh, children with disability, you know, the even currently you you have have learning through a foreign language does not procure, uh, exclude children with disability. The special education teachers work with the general education teachers. The accommodations are delivered through the language immersion program by the general education teachers. Our purpose is to have, by law, we have to have them educated in the, rich, the least restricted environment. And so we, we make sure that that is happening. And whenever there's a need for any pull out, it's being done by the special ed teacher. But majority of the time, they are in their immersion classroom being given their accommodations by language immersion teachers. So even with your starting enrollment of 325, do you plan to have a full-time special education teacher on staff, or will you contract that out? We have a full-time education, special education teacher. Okay, talk. Normally with the special education. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. My name is um, Obadiah Swin. I'm the financial manager for Baltimore International Incorporated. Normally with the special education teacher, um, it's de it dependent upon the um, special education need of the school. And we, um, when we were going through the school based on past history and um, based on the amount of students um, that have come through with special education, um, we are proposing initially, um, based on the numbers that we have a 0.5 special education teacher. Now, depending on how since um, city schools um, fund the special education program, whenever the funds are, we use other resources to get materials, and then we put all of the resources in the teacher. So that's how normally we do it. If there is more um, students that need uh, a full-time special education teacher, we put funds towards that. I have a question about, uh, uh, never mind. Uh, Commissioner Frank, I'll defer. Hi, good evening. Good evening. I'm looking at your budget revenues, uh, the Appendix 5, and it shows student enrollment starting at 325 and growing to 1,075, but the building size stays the same at 60,000 square feet. And I don't, I don't know what, what is the best practice for gross square footage divided by students, but it's probably in the 100, 100 square foot range. 
So I, I don't think that a thousand students would be able to fit in a 60,000 square foot building. Can you speak to that? You are right. Um, we are, we are um, looking, we've been looking at buildings uh, that will meet this capacity of, of um, that will be enough for the number of students we're asking for. Um, so this can be, this can be corrected. We have been looking for um, buildings that have 75,000 square feet um, and more. We've already looked at seven schools, um, with four being city schools, surplus schools, bike to the city, and three being uh, the Caddy schools. But we are, we are aware, because where we are right now is about 75,000 square feet, so we, we will make sure that we have the capacity needed to accommodate the growth. Right, and you're going to want to inflate your facility costs as well, which are pretty stable in this. So as you grow in building size, you're also going to need to grow in your cost to maintain the building. Yeah, yeah. well, norm normally what, what we have done in the past over the last couple of years, we right now in the school, BIA is housed at the um, um, St. Anthony um, School from, with the Archdiocese. And one of the things that we did is that the school itself, the building itself is 72 I mean, 70,000 square foot, but be, we became innovative and asked into put portables and all of that. Now, the reason why the cost is held constant is because we are looking at the possibilities since BIA um, Incorporated has already the, some of the funds and the investment will come from the parent organization to be able to um, underwrite some of those different things. But we are we're just looking at how what specifically are we going to be able to draw out from those different sets. So most of the funds, funding because we have already done these things in the past, we will be willing to do that. My question is about the, um, the expansion into West Baltimore. If you could just talk a little bit about uh, what kinds of conversations you've had um, in different communities in West Baltimore or with different part, potential partners, just a little bit about the relationships that you've been building as part of this process. So we have been talking to um, people from different organizations um, in West Baltimore, um, such as there's a large church in West Baltimore, I don't know if you can name names here, that has more than 7,000 members and a lot of children that go there, we have petitions for them, they are fitting it up right now. Because we have not identified a specific location in West Baltimore, we, with the building, we are just exploring the entire side, even to the west also, to um, West Baltimore, even down south, we have gone to different, we, we have met with different, um, at different church meetings, we've gone to different organizations to talk to them about, and we're actually going street to street like we did for the first BIA and filling in petitions of people that are there. And the petition that you have, the sample is that, will you have a child at this age in 2019? Will you be able to send your children with getting that kind of feedback? We're using the, the current school to also inform us about people that are on that side to be able to get to them to fill in the petition. Thank you. Helpful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cannon. Can you talk a little <clears throat> more about the operation side of it? Because it is a big operation. The schools are going to be in separate locations. Can you staff up? Uh, why do you feel confident you could staff up? Meaning finding the teachers, the qualified teachers to deliver the instruction. Um, I visited your campus. It's very impressive. But, you know, how, how, how do you, can you just talk a little bit more of, like, particularly on the staffing side. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a challenge um, to, to be able to find language immersion teachers. We have, over the years, done a lot with word of mouth from our current teachers and also have been able to tap into the different um, professional uh, organizations that advertise. We look to, for teachers in every, every wherever we can. We have visit. We have worked with the Baltimore City Public Schools um, um, job fairs and their listings that they have. Our biggest um, success has been with word of mouth. People who know the people that are educators that are perfectly bilingual in the two languages. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to scale in that era by having fairs and even 
we've even been to Puerto Rico because it's an American place and they are certified also. So we look everywhere, wherever the, the, there's an opportunity for qualified, because we believe in having certified teachers, we just need time for them to be certified. So we have, we've, we, we advertise, we, we get teachers from wherever we can find them. Let me, let me just follow, follow up on one other thing, is that one of the uniqueness of Baltimore International Academy is that um, um, most of our teachers or workers, they, they grow from within. So sometimes we have power educators who may come in and we encourage them to go through the whole um, um, training process, getting certified, and we promote because we move from one one grade level to another, we start, and we only in, um, enroll in the kindergarten level. So, like take for example, we just launched our newer um, Arabic program, and we've seen over the years all of the power professionals who have come in that will work with the kindergarten. They have all been got gotten certified and getting into the school. So that was that's one of the way that we groom our professionals and in order for them to, to get there. Very helpful. So thank you very much. Okay. And um, we appreciate you, again, um, taking the time to apply. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'd like to invite um, CEC Baltimore Campus, uh, Operator Commonwealth Education Connections. Good evening, board uh, members, um, Dr. Uh, Santelises, um, and the community. Um, thank you for allowing us to present our vision and um, school program. Um, the mission of um, Commonwealth Education is to provide each and every student that attends our school a first class and quality education that puts them on the road to academic success and achievement and citizenship. CEC plans to do this through a rigorous and challenging curriculum and school culture that evokes scholarship, creativity, and the highest level of academic standards. All CEC <coughs> alum will exit our schools with a renewed sense of passion, purpose, and confidence in their own abilities. Our program will be a safe place for innovation, innovative instruct instructional practices that guide students and staff from the course to close the achievement gap where it persists and present new growth opportunities. Our commitment to students and uh, their families as they enter high school and college will be able to succeed academically due to their literacy, numeracy, and core knowledge in science, social studies, and uh, other relevant uh, subjects. Our vision is we seek to establish uh, quality education options for students currently underserved in the East Baltimore uh, community and their families. This uh, new and unique education option will provide uh, students with an academic environment that leads to swift core skill development and constructive and enduring uh, values. Um, our academic our um, proposed school, again, is in East Baltimore serving grades um, starting the first year with 6th through 8th grades in the initial year and uh, growing from 6th uh, through 12th um, by adding uh, a grade each year. Um, the neighborhoods that uh, we've canvassed, had uh, community meetings and have shown interest is the East Midway, South Clifton Park, Broadway East, Clifton, and the Darley Park um, area. Currently, there is um, no viable middle school option or program in the area uh, for students or parents. The following schools are within a mile or uh, greater and have extensive uh, waiting lists. Uh, the Monarch Academy, which is 1.1 miles. Uh, the Green School of Baltimore, which is two miles away, Baltimore Montessori Public uh, Charter School, which is 1.5 miles away, and the Henderson um, Hopkins School, which is 1.2 uh, miles away. We have commitments from 217 parents that are interested and have filled out our preliminary uh, applications for their uh, students to attend our school. We believe that 98% of our student population will uh, come from below the poverty line, 92% of our uh, students will come from homes that uh, have incomes less than 25,000 uh, per year. I'm just going to speak briefly to our academic program. Um, we're priding ourselves in using the Apex Apex Learning 
um, program. It's an online program. It's a rigorous program. However, it is tailored um, to meet the needs of um, students' individual needs. Um, so we intend to um, support our accelerated learners as well as our um, students um, who are struggling academically. Um, also, students will learn foreign languages, French, Latin, German, Mandarin, Japanese, and Italian. Um, we're also priding ourselves by um, having a global learning, having global learning opportunities to travel to host countries, sponsored by ambassadors and embassies from the United Nations. Um, our curriculum framework will include all eight, eight subjects, um, language acquisition, language and literature, um, social studies, science, mathematics, arts, physical health, um, and design, education and design. So we also, my name is Vernell. We also have partnerships with um, community members um, such as East Baltimore Community Corporation Drug Treatment Center, East Baltimore Youth and Family Services, and I will name a few more since we don't have that much time. Men United for a Better Baltimore, um, Students First, Baltimore City Council, and we appreciate your time. Thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? I, um, oh, Commissioner Frank? Yeah, thank you. Welcome. I've I read the, particularly the mission, vision, philosophy. Um, it, and uh, this might not be a fair question because the, the answer could be no, we don't have a particular reason for being, or we don't distinguish ourselves in any particular way, or we're not in, or, or suggesting any particular model for charter school. But can you talk about? What distinguishes your program, your approach, your philosophy from other programs in Baltimore? And, and or are you modeling yourself on schools in Baltimore around the country that you want to share with us? So we've pulled, um, uh, in full disclosure, I uh, worked in New York City as an assistant deputy mayor for um, international government affairs under Mayor Bloomberg. And um, my reasoning for uh, looking to do an international affairs charter school, but not so much an um, IB program, is because international affairs has been shown to raise uh, student uh, test scores, um, levels, and disadvantaged uh, students. Also, Latin was chosen because Latin uh, helps uh, students who have uh, struggle that are struggling in writing literacy and it's a good uh, base um, for um, English as well. Um, the reason why we uh, chose um, East Baltimore and we looked at specific programs, we saw that um, Baltimore has an IB program and also the Baltimore International School. So we wanted to be different in the fact that we weren't trying to offer an IB program. Um, we wanted to offer an international affairs curriculum that was um, rooted and designed um, in with with the intent in mind that uh, we're coming into a different school district, um, looking at some of the historic uh, issues that Baltimore City has had uh, with new schools trying different innovations in the student population and seeing what worked uh, best for um, our program and what we thought would work best for our students. Um, so part of the uh, curriculum also that uh, we'll be using is the United Nations International Schools uh, curriculum, which um, will have our uh, base of international affairs. I hope I answered your question. Commissioner Bondima. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, reading the document, could you explain to us a little bit more about your partnership with uh, Churchill Swartz and uh, Harvard, Oxford, Princeton? And, and just talk to us about how they plan on supporting the program. Um, Churchill Schwartz. Excuse me. Churchill Schwartz is an um, organization that I currently uh, work for. It's a public relations and government, uh, international government affairs uh, PR firm that um, has offices in Paris, London, Luxembourg, New York City, um, LA, and uh, Washington, D.C. Um, Churchill Schwartz plans on playing a role in to, su in to support us with any um, startup funds or um, funding that we need up to 750000 for the first year. Um, also, um, Hope UA, um, which is a education uh, management uh, organization, um, plans on helping us uh, with uh, startup um, funding or um, helping us find uh, teachers, uh, along with uh, Student First and other um, administrative uh, things. 
Thank you. I'd like to know a little bit about um, your team's experience um, starting a school. Um, I, mean, our I, I mean, I know sometimes people come <laughs> for charter applications and they have experience, sometimes they don't, but um, it sort of matters that there's some kind of collection of educational experience, finance experience, et, um, management experience uh, on, the ch on the founding team and that there's some thought into the team's um, uh, sort of educate, you know, sort of educational leader. So I, I, that's a kind of a big deal to me. Great. Um, so two of our board members um, have uh, opened and founded uh, charter schools um, in Philadelphia and in New York uh, City. As um, far as our management team, um, Raquel, who's going to be the chief academic officer, has been a principal and an administrator um, in private and um, charter schools and public schools. Um, as far as uh, finance and operations um, go, our chief, uh, chief financial officer, um, Ms. Adrian, um, currently is the deputy uh, chief financial officer for merger and acquisitions for uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and has um, a wealth of experience in uh, managing funds and uh, capital. Okay, thank you. And um, the note one thing, uh, the councilman, um, Stokes came out in support of our pro, uh, in support of our proposal and he's here this evening uh, to support us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we have one more question. Commissioner Richardson. I just have one more question. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about your outreach to the neighborhood? Sure. Um, we've networked and um, outreach to the community. We actually have community partners on um, the Enoch Pratt Library, which is so this the, um, in East Baltimore. The building that we propose to locate um, the school in is the William C. March building, which will be surplus back uh, to the uh, city. And um, as our letters of support say, um, the city council and um, uh, different members of um, the land use committee have um, given uh, us the uh, support to uh, use that building once it's surplus, surplus back to the city. The, um, it's the Enoch Pratt Library that we've reached out to, which is directly on the corner from the um, school, to um, use that facility to uh, have after school programs, uh, literacy programs within the community, not only for our uh, school students, but also for um, the parents as well. Um, we've reached out and uh, networked with a list of different uh, churches and community groups um, and we've had uh, community uh, meetings. We're going to continue to have community meetings um, once we uh, know um, if we're approved or not to continue to build interest uh, for our school and um, it's actually, can I see this really quick? It's actually, you got it. So um, the community uh, partners that we have is the Enoch uh, Pratt Library, um, Eastern Methodist Church, Church of the New Covenant, Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, um, Kid Stuff, um, Child Care, and the uh, Oliver Recreation Center, where we've held uh, one of our outreach sessions. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next, we'd like to invite um, the Da Vinci Collaborative. As are our supporters joining us there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, Dr. Sanalisis, and city school staff. My name is Helene Luce, and I am the co-founder, along with Travis Henschen, of the Da Vinci Collaborative. In spite of today's emphasis on standardized testing, we all know that st students do not learn in a standardized way. The Da Vinci Collaborative will ensure that students learn more effectively by connecting high school subjects to each other and to the real world. We agree with the Kerwin Commission that high schools need to expand the opportunities for apprenticeships. And, like Da Vinci himself, our students will understand how the arts and sciences are woven together. Students, families, and employers often do not see the connection between what students are learning in school and career pathways. All these stakeholders, however, desire that students learn workplace behaviors and practical skills that lead to meaningful employment. 
Da Vinci engages students in developing skills through projects where the college-ready content that they're learning is applied to authentic situations. This method enables students to visualize how different subjects apply to their own real-world existence as well as career paths. Moreover, engagement in the creative arts strongly correlates with success later in life through improved brain activity while fostering enthusiasm for learning. Da Vinci will utilize summit learning and big picture learning to support this model. The summit personalized learning platform provides common core aligned curriculum used successfully in schools for each student, excuse me, used successfully in schools throughout the nation, but also allows teachers to differentiate learning for each student. Summit assesses content mastery, helps plan college and career goals, and monitors collaborative projects that build cognitive skills. Big Picture Learning, a nationwide network of schools, provides us with specific guidance and professional development in areas of school culture and leading students to learn through their interests. Our model addresses several priorities listed by you, the school board. First, our curriculum will provide rigor while engaging students in activities that are tailored to their interests. Da Vinci students work individually and collaboratively to attain mastery in core subjects. Second, the Da Vinci Collaborative engages families in making decisions about the school and encourages community members to participate actively by mentoring youth. Finally, the Da Vinci Collaborative fills a need for a different type of high school in a geographic location, southeast Baltimore, that has few high schools but many school-aged children. In conclusion, the Da Vinci Collaborative is rigorous yet supportive, personalized but filled with collaboration. We combine the best qualities of existing public and non-public schools with unique aspects such as running year-round, internships, and interdisciplinary learning. I'd now like to introduce Blanca Tapuasa, one of our founding parents, who will present her perspective on the need for the school. Thank you so much. As a parent who is soon going to be enrolling high school students, I am thrilled to be part of the Da Vinci team. This is a team that is, ex the expertise is exceptional, the vision is one that will bring a student to be able to be a, first, treated as a, a future contributing adult, and it will um, include an in in individualized classroom learning that also infuses the mentorship. The Da Vinci team has spent uh, many hours and days reaching the Southeast community and through one of the community meetings, I, I met them. Uh, over 500 signatures have been collected, 20 founding parents now is a result of that outreach in the community. What Da Vinci offers is uh, for every student to be, uh, enable every student to be the potential best of them and also he or she will reach the potential that uh, surpasses their own their own uh, expectations. So we want to see Da Vinci to be the hub of excellent education. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions? Uh, we'll start. We'll go around. Commissioner Hassan. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, given your proposed opening enrollment of 125 students, mm -hmm. how is it that you plan on being able to economically mm -hmm. afford both your arts integration as well as meeting the Comar basic requirements? We're including an arts teacher in our um, core um, group of teachers. We've budgeted for seven teachers. Um, and we were told that special ed and ELL would be provided by the district through um, that particular, the funding that is provided, depending on the level of, of uh, students that we have. Um, and as far as I know, you had the question about phys ed, we're going to have to rely that first year on some part-time staff, which is also in our budget and then we'll uh, beef up to a full-time staff in year two or three. And health education falls in that same category? Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, that's fine. We'll, go, we'll stay on this side. Commissioner McFadden? Thank you. Please explain to me your uh, theory or philosophy around arts integration and how do you um, anticipate moving that plan forward at your school? We are going to ask students to take four uh, four trimesters of arts throughout their school year and one of the functions of the art teacher will be to work with the core teachers and um, infuse arts into each subject. We're also going to have two blocks each week 
of um, an interdisciplinary block that we're calling the Da Vinci Studio, where specifically each subject um, or several subjects are combined to create real life authentic projects so that um, we believe that everything includes art, everything includes science. In other words, we're not going to isolate each subject and not th the point is to show students how the real world works, that mm -hmm. everything that you do doesn't just fall into a category of this is a math problem or this is a biology problem. Does that answer your question? <laughs> so project based, uh, a project Correct. based model. Right. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Canham? Okay. Um, I have a series of questions. So, uh, did you? Is this your second time applying? Yes, it is. What's different from this application from the last application? What did you? I'm so glad you asked that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the we we spent many um, several meetings with Ms. Alvarez going over what we um, what we were told were the weaknesses in our application, and we specifically went back and addressed those. For example. Um, they felt that our uh, addressing of students with special needs was insufficient. Um, one of our team members spent a great deal of time outlining the process of identifying, um, integrating, and providing specific um, supports for special needs. Do you want to yeah, talk um, to this? I'd be happy to add additional things. Um, we officially affiliated with Big Picture Learning, uh, which is a network of schools across the country. There's over 60. Um, schools in that network. Um, we were drawn to their model, um, you know, many years ago when we were coming up with the, you know, general philosophy of the model. Um, but they really integrate a strong advisory program, which we are, you know, also implementing. Um, they also do real world learning, so through internships and apprenticeships. Um, but that are rooted in student interest. So we've had several design sessions with um, uh, I guess you consultants from uh, big picture learning and we signed a contract and it's in our um, application. They also provide professional development that's ongoing, um, technology tools. Um, in addition to big picture learning, uh, we have already um, started c configuring and adapting the summit learning curriculum and testing the platform. That'll be used to not only track student goals um, and monitor projects, but students will also engage in some self-directed learning modules um, because we want them to be self-directed learners to be prepared for college and career. Um, so working with Summit, um, we've expanded our board and advisory board, um, and we've begun um, and have been successful in soliciting um, partners for internships. Um, we also have several team members uh, that have experience um, starting schools with strong internship programs. Um, so we brought in the community support. Um, we've also started a youth board. Um, so we have the community element, but we also have you know, connected with nationally recognized um, groups to strengthen uh, our approach. Okay, um, so there's a lot going on here. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, I'm just trying to, if a little bit, how does it all come together in particular? So I, I, I just am struggling a bit to see how it all comes together. In particular, can you talk more about the internships and apprenticeships? I don't like those promises that aren't actually fulfilled that are connected to real life opportunities and real paid opportunities for youth. And a lot of times people talk about internships and apprenticeships, yet there's no really meat on the bone. So can you just, can you talk in particular how that all comes to fruition? Sure. Um, so. The, now, all students will engage in, a, in one form of real-world learning in all four years of their experience at the Da Vinci Collaborative. Um, we recognize, and we know this, especially because many team members, including myself, have worked in schools like Christa Ray Jesuit High School that has an internship for all students. Um, so we recognize that it's a heavy lift to um, kind of secure those partnerships. This is another reason for partnering with Big Picture Learning. Um, Real world learning was what they call it, but it's really an internship program. Um, and they have devised an entire program to help us get that off the ground, um, including a technology tool in which students can use to help, um, which students use to us uh, to explore their interests. So through the advisory program in year one, um, all of our students begin to explore their interests and be exposed to different career and internship opportunities. Um, they will engage in both service to the school and the surrounding communities. Um, we will also explicitly teach workplace readiness skills so that they have a certain baseline level of readiness. Um, at Chris Ray, we found that some employers didn't want to offer an internship because they felt like 
the student, ironically, wasn't ready for the, the task that they needed at their placement. So we want a baseline level there in the first year before we send them off to internships. Um, that will give us not only the pre-opening year and year one to secure the foundation of intern. Right now, we have 15 partnerships. Um, we, are, we recognize that we need to ramp this up. Um, but in the catch-22 situation we're in right before getting approved, it's like, you know, it's like upon approval, it's much easier to kind of approach a company um, or an organization to say, we are opening in 2019. Let's, let's do this. Um, so moving on from the opening year where they're learning workplace skills um, and they've started to explore their interests, um, starting in the second year the, um, of our program, um, students will be placed in internships. They'll range um, in length of time. Uh, we think that's necessary to be flexible. Not all um, organizations can host an intern year round. Some might, some might not, but we also want students the chance, to give them the chance to explore many options. And then we're also working with a group um, that's new to Baltimore called Trans Ed um, Apprenticeship Services, which is an outgrowth um, of some work done by the Children's Guild, um, which I know is connected to Monarch Academy. Um, we're working with them because they want to expand down um, to provide a high school apprenticeship pathway. So we're imagining by the last two years, some students are doing internships, but some that you know, they're, they're kind of on a more um, set path based on their interests and future goals, and they're doing apprenticeships. I hope that, that helps. <laughs> Commissioner Frank? Could you talk about your facility and where you're planning to go, and also over time, how you'll, whether you'll stay in that facility to accommodate your growth? Sure. We're um, in the process this week, actually, of uh, submitting a letter of intent to uh, the Archdiocese for the building that was formerly known as Sacred Heart of Mary. Um, more recently, it was housing the AmeriCorps Training Center. Um, the federal government has completely renovated the building, so it is move-in ready with the exception of redoing the kitchen, um, state-of-the-art HVAC, um, Wi-Fi, et cetera, which was a really great find for us. Um, and it is a 60,000 square feet facility, which will could hold us up through all four years if we don't find something else. Um, we'd like to be a little closer to the heart of the area in the map that you have. Um, as you see, that's, um, but we would be in Southeast and we would be, um, you know, closer to a lot of neighborhoods there than um, other existing schools. Uh, the, um <laughs> Your pro forma shows rent, so yes. you convert that to a mortgage, or how would? No, we're not buying the building. Oh, I thought your letter of intent was to rent. Was to rent, right? And the terms match what you have in your. Correct. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Chinia. You, you were mentioning um, that the build your area that you're sort of looking at is in southeast, mm -hmm. and so given. Um, um, another part of the population in that area which is around uh, English language learners. Mm -hmm. What specifically are you planning to do in terms of support for those students? We have uh, several team members who are um, either certified or dual certified in uh, English language learning. Um, we have a very explicit protocol for those students as, as we did for special ed um, outlining in uh, section 9 I believe of our application. Uh, all of the supports that we have. One of the reasons we adopted Summit is because they do provide um, uh, adaptations for both special ed and ESOL learners. Um, so that makes it, um, puts a little bit less burden on you know one or two teachers so we can have all of our teachers um, assisting and doing modifications as we go along. Um, but we are, committed to doing outreach. In fact, um, our flyers that have gone out have been in Spanish and English. We're very committed to making sure that, um, and we will also, of course, adopt other languages as, as needed, but um, that seems, you know, that's the largest portion of the non-English speaking community. So we are making a specific effort. Um, we're putting a lot of things out uh, that are dual language to start with to indicate that we're welcoming that part of the population. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, Green Street Academy.
I just you're good okay thank you uh, good evening Board of Commissioners uh, Dr. Santelisas Office of New Initiatives Ms. Alvarez uh, Mr. Roberts thank you so much for having us and uh, taking under consideration Green Street Academy's proposal to expand uh, its current offerings down to pre-k through five um, I figure what's best to do here is introduce the folks next to me without which this wouldn't be possible and also give a touch of context to the to the request to my left is Transformation Principal uh, Crystal Harden Lindsay. Um, she's the best at what she does, and I couldn't, you know, imagine doing this without her. And to my right is the co-founder and co-chair of our board, uh, Larry Rivets. Um, Green Street Academy started as a transformation school. It had about 200 students. This is nine years ago now, um, at the old West Baltimore Middle. Um, and currently, we serve 815 students in grades six through 12. Um, we also occupy a 140,000 square foot LEED Platinum certified building in the heart of the neighborhood that we serve, which makes this the second largest K-12 LEED Platinum building in the world um, that's used for K-12. So um, we have some experience, obviously, growing, growing our programming um, and certainly even growing divisions. Uh, we started, like I said, as a middle, and now we have a full high school with our first graduating class having graduated last year, and we're looking forward to our second graduating class coming up. Uh, on the backs of strong academic indicators, uh, an SPM last year of 95, um, and uh, a desirability that's uh, pretty incredible. We've had over 1,000 applicants for our school annually for the last three years for fewer than 250 slots. Um, we think now is the time uh, to build down into K-5. Into, uh, K uh, we think that at the heart of our K-5 experience needs to be mindfulness and illiteracy. Um, many of our students who come to us in sixth grade uh, come ill-prepared for the challenges that they face at Green Street Academy and the rigor of the curriculum that we offer. And so um, to talk a little bit about the capacity that we believe the school has already within the school to make this move, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Lindsay. Good evening. Um, we um, currently have an assistant principal that has um, worked in um, at Lakeland Elementary School for the last few years before coming to Green Street Academy. Prior to um, being a principal here, I taught pre-K through second grade for 10 years um, at William Packer Elementary School. Um, our school is really excited about the opportunity to extend to um, the elementary school level already having several teachers that are elementary school certified. So we're really at a place where we really want to see the school grow. Uh, first, let me thank you all and your predecessors for the privilege of letting us launch Green Street Academy from this table nine years ago. It was lonely up here, let me tell you. Um, but the mission, vision, and strategy we envisioned at that time continues to bear fruit today. Uh, of the original core values, perseverance applies not only to student achievement, but also to the commitment we've made as a board, uh, co-founders, staff, et cetera, to build a collaborative and durable culture, particularly important at this moment as we uh, hope to expand uh, and our reach. So perseverance speaks to our continuous drive for excellence, a founding tenant in the classroom and our staffing, with our new LEED Platinum state-of-the-art facility, our families and our community partners, and even on the varsity football field where our first year season was eight and two, <coughs> go Chargers. <laughs> uh, during the current school year, our board resolved to look deeply into our work and generate the first strategic plan since our founding. In the process, we engaged our board, faculty, students, and community members in a series of discussions which ultimately yielded several long-term growth opportunities, the first priority of which is expansion to K-12. To K uh, we reasoned that including younger students earlier in the process would benefit the entire institution and the outcomes for our students would more effectively fulfill our original mission, and I quote, to create a pipeline of inspired, self-reflective, 
and well-qualified young people who are prepared to graduate, advance their studies, build careers, and sustain themselves, their families, and their communities. We as a board and as a school community are excited about this perspective expansion and hope you will enable us to fully realize our dream to create an anchor institution in West Baltimore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open for questions. Commissioner McFadden. Could you uh, be a little bit more detailed about your academic plan for the elementary school students that uh, you're planning to expand the school for? Um, we would like to um, use Dibbles as one of the data points um, in our early early education, early grades. We also want to look closely at the social emotional side of educating the scholars. Um, right now we're using iReady in the middle school. Um, we plan to expand down and see um, what our scholars actually need. Right now we have a model for um, our middle school grades where we have a special educator paired with um, our lowest performance scholars as a way to support them throughout the day. We plan to have a similar co-teaching model in our elementary school as, um, as we meet, work to meet the needs of our scholars. I'll also add that, I'm sorry, on the mindfulness side, we're planning on using the mindfulness-based stress reduction program uh, that comes out of Massachusetts that's seen some really good results. Does that speak to the academic uh, aspect, the, that, what you just referenced? Oh, the mindful. Well, so to be honest with you, uh, some of the issues academically. It's we, holistic, right? Exactly. Sure. It's, it's, it's an ability to be able to focus, um, to be able to really reach your capacity and your potential as a student. And if you're distracted, if you are in a place um, in your head where you can't fully concentrate on what's being taught, then unfortunately it obviously has a negative impact on what it is you're able to accomplish and show everybody you're able to accomplish academically. And so unless we're able to support our students in being able to cope and center themselves and become the most effective students they can be from that place, we're going to be leaving some potential on the table academically, we believe. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, um, hi everyone, good to see everybody. Um, the, how does the sustainability in the green piece is, uh, you know, infuse into the elementary school? I wasn't clear on that. He stole my question. Oh, no, well, <laughs> sorry. It's a good question, but of course. Um, so, one of the things that we were very purposeful about when we developed the building wasn't just the Wi-Fi and the structure, it was the furniture. Um, and you'll see why I'm talking about this in a second. The furniture allows for dynamic small group work to happen immediately. Pacing is incredibly quick in our classrooms uh, in a large part because you can be in test taking mode, partner mode, small group mode, and full class discussion mode within 30 seconds. Um, so there's not much off time. Our school, I believe, is as successful as it is because of its reliance on small group and collaboration. And one of the things that you're able to do in small work and collaboration is do some investigative work, some hands-on learning. I mean, for instance, just last Friday, we were lucky enough to have uh, an entire pollinator garden uh, put in by uh, the National Wildlife Federation along with Blue Water Baltimore and uh, Biohabitats. And I mention this because our students took part in the planning of it, our students took part in the uh, planting of it, and they will take part, obviously, in the maintenance and the data collection from it. And so with an eight-and-a-half-acre classroom, which is what Green Street Academy sits on, we're able to leverage uh, our opportunities outdoors as well as indoors with our furniture and our small group work to make sure that students, even as young as elementary students, are interacting with nature, whether it's as simple as water testing outside and soil testing and air testing, or whether it's coming in and actually starting to do some more uh, significant analysis of their data in science classrooms in the fifth grade. Um, Hi. My question has to do with um, uh, when you talk about expanding uh, to go into the elementary grades, um, what conversations, outreach, um, discussions have you had with uh, elementary school parents, families? That's a, that's a big, I mean, it's a big different, yeah. it's a big difference. I mean, they're thinking different things when mm -hmm. they're thinking about where to send there. And you're starting at 30. I'll combine my question. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to understand the economics of 30, uh, <laughs> given that 
You, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. you're, you're bringing them into an existing school, so I think your economics are different than the other questions we're asking. Exactly. But I do want to understand that um, a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, because those parents are, are thinking completely different thoughts than, like, the sixth grade parents. Mm -hmm. So if you could just help me understand that a little bit in terms of your outreach. So I'll start with the outreach and end with the economics, if that's That'd be all right. Great. Um, so, and Crystal can speak to this firsthand because she's at the other end of the phone line. But anecdotally, we've been receiving requests for an elementary school basically since we've been open. Um, parents want a safe, stable, uh, rigorous environment to send their kids. Of course they do. Um, and a lot of the things, particularly that we and I use the word promise, but we talk about in our mission, our vision, when, I, when we say that we're going to, you know, do certain things, have certain programs, they're there. I mean, this year we're going to have 250 paid interns in the high school. We will have had the graduating class. We have varsity athletics. Parents see that and they realize that they want uh, an opportunity for their students when they're younger as well. Sixth grade sometimes is, uh, is late for our parents, and our parents who have sixth graders also have younger siblings who are looking for places as well. Um, we literally put out uh, uh, a call to parents to say, you know, would you be in support of a Green Street Academy elementary school? And it was literally 24 hours before we had, I think, 60 or 65 signatures. Um, and that is, I think, indicative of the type of desire that uh, not just, and those are just parents within our school, uh, but parents around the community feel they want a place uh, like a Green Street Academy to send, to send their students. And economically, um, I would say that you touched on the fact that we already have uh, an established school, so it's a, it's a little bit different. And we were lucky enough this past year to get through a bond refinancing with the support of the board and the system. Um, and what that did was it completely stabilized our school financing, such that in order to meet covenants on the debt service for the building, we don't need the elementary school to spin off additional funding. We can operate the elementary school itself at break even or even a little bit less and still be in a place where we are more than tripling and quadrupling our covenants, whether they're debt service coverage or uh, liquidity. Um, and so uh, we believe one thing that we've learned as we built the middle and the high schools, it's school culture. You can't mess with it. You can't start um, down a slippery slope with school culture and then try to get it back. And so what's really important for us is to make sure that as we build out, as we expand, in this case, down, um, that we do so in a responsible way that makes sure that we can maintain and even strengthen our school culture as we continue to grow to what's going to eventually be over 1,000 students in a single site. That's helpful. When we, when we uh, so thanks. I, I thought that was going to be the economics answer. I just wanted to kind of yeah. confirm it. Um, when we... Are come to this point. We're trying to take in all the information that we've that uh, we get so far. So we, you know, what you've written, um, and we get some information about the the interview process. And it um, it sounds like you have reached out to your parents of the current existing students for regarding siblings, but. From what we understood, that wasn't something that you you said you hadn't done outreach when you were in the interview. So I'm, I'm just, could you sync that up for me? So we hadn't. So our outreach was within our own school. We didn't do like external. So outreach. literally, the, the distinction between external and internal. Yes. Cool. Just I was just curious. No, no, that's yeah, absolutely. Um, Commissioner Canham has a question, and then oh. Commissioner Berkeley, so Commissioner Richardson. Why so small? Like uh, why thirty? Why why wouldn't you do more elementary ones that would feed into the middle school and all that? Like. Why are we, why is it so small? We want to under promise and over deliver. Uh, I don't want to be in a position where I say we can take a certain number of students and it turns out that that number can't be reached responsibly or without using space inappropriately or um, really cramming students into spaces where uh, they won't fit. Um, our ent the way that we've been able to lay out the building and this is, I want to say, part planning, part luck. Um, our building is going to be elementary school first level, middle school second level, high school third level, and it works out perfectly that way. However, on the first level, those are where all our administrative offices are as well. And so there are fewer classrooms. 
and as we retrofit the building in order to get ready for elementary school, obviously in the younger classrooms we're going to need to do some things with restrooms and stuff that we don't have to do for middle schoolers currently. And so that's going to sort of decrease the space. And so I'd much rather come back and ask for more room than have to do something where we're not reaching an enrollment cap, um, where we're not sort of living up to the numbers that we stipulated that we could reach. Um, and so really that's, that's where we believe sort of the responsible starting place to be, if, if that makes any sense, with room for uh, growth if, if the site will allow and if obviously there continues to be such strong demand. Commissioner Bondima. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm one of the board members that's from higher ed and, and working with K through 12 as well. But so um, I, this kind of question I, I'm asking is because of putting together at, um, at Prince George Community College, we brought in ninth graders and um, early, early, you know, early decision, early getting degrees early. And we had buildings separate. Mm -hmm from the college students and my mind started going back there and my concern was um, you bring you want to bring in the, um, the elementary kids and then you have the middle school because I saw your video it was excellent when you presented here before but how you say you're gonna have students on different <coughs> levels mm -hmm. I'm greatly concerned with having um, how you separate those younger students from the older students and just having them on separate levels is a concern of mine. And you did say something about building out bathrooms and all those mm -hmm. different things. When you start bringing that group all together from K through 12, uh, that brings great concern because students are able to move mm -hmm. around, even though we say they can't move around. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you plan on doing that, uh, accomplishing it with those all those groups? Usually. At, at, from K through 12, you are in different buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, I know Roland Park is, has uh, one building and they have the other building. How do you plan on doing that? And not just with locking the doors or blocking. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I think it's, it's two prong. I think, first of all, Crystal and the entire school team has done an incredible job making a school of 815 seem small. But everybody knows everybody at Green Street. Um, and that has to do with. Uh, the stability of the staff and the administration, but also with um, the structures that the school has in place to make sure that m student movement around the school is, is regulated uh, and that everybody recognizes where students are supposed to be. So to just be very, uh, try to be brief, um, that is sort of a school culture side, but a structural side is that students have, uh, they go to the classes in different colored hallways. So every floor has two separate colored hallways. Students in those colored hallways receive colored passes, the color of their hallway, such that when they are walking the halls, you can see what class they came from. Every single color, so every single floor that's split into two, has its own boys and girls restroom, water fountain, and filling station. So students don't need to move around the building for anything other than when they're called to the main office for something specific. Um, so there's a lot of accountability that the adults take on within the school building and that the physical structure itself helps to keep students separate. And I'll also say this, and I certainly understand that K-5 and 6-8 and 9-12, they're all totally different ball games. But we have had experience and success doing something with the 6-12 that I know is difficult as well, which is separating the middle school from the high school and using the levels in these systems to do so. And so the thought here is that on the difficult or the challenge end, I would say students intermixing, that's absolutely a challenge. That's something we have to make sure we identify, something we continue to make sure that we're strong on. But the positive side of that is the role modeling and the mentorship and the possibilities that exist between elementary schoolers and high schoolers in supervised and structured ways that can absolutely not only accelerate the elementary student's experience, but also help the high schooler continue to develop socially and emotionally themselves. And so with these challenges come these trade-offs where because these things don't exist in this district and really not too many other places, single site K-12s, even though there's research that says that this is actually a really helpful thing academically, um, that 
that we recognize absolutely the challenge and that we have um, in place systems that we believe will continue to make sure that our students remain safe and that they remain appropriately separated. Commissioner Berkeley. Yes, I have a, just a question about literacy. And um, I haven't looked into this recently, but last I looked into it, about 75 to 85 percent of the population will probably learn to read almost no matter what happens. But for the remaining um, 15 to 25 percent, it makes all the difference in the world. So I have a question because you're, you're getting into early literacy here. Yes. So one of the um, one of the things that we're doing this year is looking at the American Reading Company. So in the next two weeks, some of our middle school teachers will have professional development around research labs for our lower end scholars to provide an additional intervention. Um, and I think that one of the major keys is getting kids interested in reading. Um, by the time they get to middle school, sometimes they've kind of checked out, like I love reading or I don't love reading. So kind of refueling um, their desire to learn to read. We're trying something a little bit different by looking at the American Reading Company. We know that they have the EARL the inventory for reading um, that we're going to start to implement for our lower scholars. And we're hoping that we could use this with our um, elementary school scholars because it's something that I have experienced with before when I taught um, elementary school and we um, saw great success using this measure as well as continuing with the small group instruction and the guiding read it, guided reading practices um, as well as teaching our our current teachers some work doing some work around phonemic awareness and phonics is something that they've been asking for anyway so it will fall right in line to what we need to learn um, to get fully prepared for the elementary school um, it just is kind of falling in place at the right time you're welcome Commissioner Richardson thank you um, I just wanted to know are there any plans, if you have not done so already, to talk with the leaders at the Green School, because they are an elementary school already, and you had mentioned about the difficulty with working with sixth graders who are unprepared for, for the sixth grade. So was that ever an, uh, an option for you or a thought process um, as you are developing this, this plan? Actually, um, I really uh, appreciate the suggestion. We haven't reached out to the Green School, although certainly um, we can and we should and we will um, to see how it is they leverage environmental education in their, uh, in their space. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for your patience you. with we all our questions. It. Before we call our last school, I want to apologize to the members of the general public. Um, we have one more school to present, which means we're about a little over half an hour behind from the start of our public meeting. And I guess just for the future, I want to ask the staff, um, it's not, an, it's people have been good about containing their presentations to the all, all, allotted four minutes, but it, this is the only chance that board members have to ask questions. So if, if we could uh, think differently next time and give us more time for these meetings, just for, just for, what it's in the, for what it's worth category, we need more time. So if I could please have members of the Baltimore Latin School. material that you're giving us in the folder, is this different than the material that's a part of your application? Is this material that's in these binders, is this at all different than what's in the application? Oh yeah, we have access to all the application material. Yeah, no, we have access to everything. Okay, so I'll, okay. Yeah, the, the book, I, I guess the book is a repeat of the application which we have online. So if we could get the yeah, if we could just get a copy of what's different. 
If somebody wants the whole thing, they can have I, I read all my stuff online anyway. So, all right, let's do it. <coughs> President and CEO of Latin Schools of America and a member of our foundation board. And we share your vision and commitment for transforming student lives. And at its core, this is at the core of our proposal, which is an all boys um, school with a boarding option that will be language immersion and STEAM intensive. In the interest of optimizing time, we've provided some binders and you'll keep some information and what you've already got, we don't want to be duplicitous with. We just wanted to make sure everyone had everything. Oh, that's fair. I was just curious. I, I just great. Thank sure. you. So some of our members have traveled a great distance to be with us today and prepared statements that they'd like to have integrated as part of the record, and we'll just try to make them as we go. And we're also grateful to have Councilman Stokes here. He and a number of other members of our city council have been very supportive of the application. Um, for the purpose of driving today's discussion, we have some display boards with nuggets of core application pieces that may be used to drive our Q&A. Um, while I'm the conversation floater, we're privileged to be joined by John Brenner from the University of Baltimore, um, one of our collaborative partners to discuss college readiness. John? Hello, everyone. I'm John Brenner, Director of Early College Initiatives at the University of Baltimore. And the University of Baltimore is excited to join Baltimore Latin School in preparing our students for college. We have a shared belief that the best way to do so is to immerse students in college study while they're still in high school. I believe on our display boards there is some information about college readiness, okay. and I'm happy to answer questions. Great, thank you. And now we have our single Kirkland Smith, the board expert on the code assessment tool, as well as school leadership management, having been a principal of a charter school and as well a public school. Our Cinco. Good afternoon. I'm Arsenko Smith with the Kirkland Group. The Kirkland Online Assessment Tool, it is an authentically created tool for assessment purposes. It bridges formative and summative assessments. It has the ability or the capability of bringing in your formative statewide assessment and you partner it with the in-house assessments. And the beauty is that it puts those two together and it actually creates a very predictive and a very valid assessment that teachers can use. Thank and you. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. And I then we also have Marita Santana Jonas, who is also serving in a dual capacity as chair of our foundation board, which is independent and will manage our real estate investment and schools portfolio. Marita has a background in real estate finance and, in addition, a passion for education, having served as the president of the Stanford um, New York School Board. Marita? Um, Jeff was going to be with, her, with us tonight, so Jeff is the co chairman. So he and I are both real estate and development experts committed to managing our facility management plan and real estate portfolio. The concept of Baltimore Latin is about so much more than creating a school. It's about economic development and building a beautiful community. Our design, build, proprietary program, the blocks that Baltimore Latin built, will drive that while creating a world-class education in STEAM and language immersion. We have identified a negotiated facility and are in the process of investigating Excellent. other acquisitions. Excellent. I'm sorry, we've got one minute left. And we've Go got Dr. Pearl Glasgow and Dr. Don Roberts. Pearl is talking about community engagement and Don, a core component, the art of manhood in our program. Pearl, quickly. Microphone. Sorry. Dr. Ellen Fleury does comment on the design concept, engaging, engaging the community is critical, and our founding families will be at the core of this. We have several letters of support from members of the Baltimore City Council, and we have been building bridges through civic association and athletic leagues. Excellent. Pearl, Don, anything about the art of manhood and that portion of our curriculum? Um, we're, I'm really excited, and it's necessary for young men today. As a board, we firmly believe in the uh, etiquette and proper professional exploration of development and secure space for boys to discuss their environment and uh, manhood and is critical. And we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to leave, that, we're leave that be. We don't want to cut them off, but we're going to be very respectful. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. give you that. We're going to be very nice respectful job. of the time that we have. We wanted to script it out so that we could get the core elements all in one and everyone could participate. Um, so we're open for any questions that you may have, and thank you so much for the opportunity. And just to be clear, this, this school we're talking to is for opening, not next year, but the year after. The application had a glitch, and there is something that is listed um, on the website, um, and that's something that it's the board's discretion, but it's the recommendation of staff that this is something that would open for the 2020-2021 school year. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to clarify. Uh, questions? Uh, Commissioner Hassan? 
So similar question to what I've asked before, given an opening enrollment of 200 students yes. and knowing how we fund schools, how are you prepared to get the additional funding that you would need to meet basic Comar requirements, specifically around arts, health, and physical education? Well, Farida, would you like to talk a little bit about that? That's where the, the real estate component comes in. Okay, we, um, being involved in school administration from a board perspective, but in managing a budget of over $8 million, sitting on an IDA board where my focus has been on economic, economic development, a lot of schools fall short when it comes to meeting unfunded mandates, um, you know, me meeting, you know, just the budgetary you know, constraints. Um, and so what I felt in, in talking with Alicia, due to the leadership in, in her foresight, she's like, look, we're gonna ha we may have some issues, and right now it, it's, under, it's, it's underfunded by $5 million. I think you guys cut the budget by $5 million. Mm -hmm. So the, the charter school budget. Not a, this, I got you. Okay. So our, our goal is to go ahead and acquire some real estate or we could generate some re the, the revenue for the, as, as a foundation, as a partner with the school to generate the shortfall that the school will experience. And may I add just a little bit to sure. dovetail onto that? Sure. In looking at the budget preliminarily, even with everything that we're talking about, mm -hmm. we wanted to be very particular to be conservative. This is a very aggressive and ambitious program, and we understand that. Um, certain aspects of this, we have collaborative and community partners that will enable us in addition to setting up a foundation board that will do real estate acquisition and investment. We also want you to know that from the perspective of budgeting and the budget that we have provided, that we wanted to operate within the guidelines of what would be permitted or allowed. We've been in contact for art, for example, and we're looking at architecture as art, and that's the focus that we would want with art, and that's actually a part of STEAM. We've already had a conversation with the Maryland Institute and College of Art and are looking at the potential for a collaboration. Given the fact that we have not gotten our proposal adopted just yet, it was too early in the process for us to get too far down the road. That's just one example. It's also talked in terms of athletics with Alexandria Lacrosse, for example, and we have identified five sports that we would want to focus in. So when we look at physical education as a part of the curriculum and the teaching insofar as how we're hiring, we've got coaching staff that we're looking at bringing on board in the confines of what we already have. But just in case there's something that may not be properly anticipated, you always want to be prepared. In addition to that, 5% in the contingent reserves. Again, there's a separate organization. And then even with our budget that we provided to you, we are looking for grant or outside funding. We are not anticipating in the first, however, two years of operation that we would have that. And as a result, that is not reflected in our budget. But there are a number of private foundations, and we've noted some of them in the application. And we'll definitely be looking and working aggressively to get that in addition to our real estate acquisitions portfolio. Does that fully answer your question? Thank you. Commissioner Frank. Yeah, thank you. I, I didn't fully understand the facilities plan, so I saw there's a building on St. Paul Street that you would lease, and then there was some interest in vacant, vacant buildings in Johnson Square. And I also heard you say that you would potentially buy real estate as a way of raising revenue for the school. So can you tie all that together and help us understand where would you be in the first or first or second year and what, what are the, how do the two campuses relate to each other? Oh, absolutely. Florida, oh, would you you like, start, you start with St. Paul. Okay, St. Paul Street, 1020 St. Paul Street is a building that was a former travel agency and there are three levels to it. Only two of them have previously been developed. We're very particular. One way that we're able to make our economic plan work was the fact that we could lease this space. And in leasing the space, we have a letter that's also included in our application where we lease this building space for $8,000 a month, essentially $96,000 a year. Um, the numbers didn't come out of the air. So you would lease the entire building? The entire building. So you would buy that as an investment? And no. You, no, I'm sorry. There is a group out of London right. that owns this building, has owned this building for a very long time. We've chatted with a number of realtors who specialize in real estate in Mount Vernon, and we've also chatted with the realtor representing the group. They have no interest in selling that building. What they do have an interest in, Commissioner, is in renovating the building for a long-term tenant, and they have agreed with us to a price for a five-year term that would be renewable, consistent with, or coinciding with our renewals as, as they would come up 
with the school board. So that would be that building, five to 10 minutes away. We like this location because with the University of Baltimore as a collaborative partner, interesting to be able to start taking courses for college credit in the ninth grade. Um, some courses can be contained on our campus and we've negotiated these courses with the University of Baltimore talking with Mr. Brenner. He was one of the first to sign on for our school. Mm -hmm. It's five to seven minutes walking distance from the building at St. Paul. Johnston Square is about 10 minutes away also. So with the flow of how things would go with our classes, when we look at Johnston Square in that space, we see a larger blueprint than just this. So mm -hmm. our language classes, our language arts classes, we would primarily want to have those housed in the property on St. Paul Street. So we have the capacity to accommodate up to 128 students in this building with a 16 to 1 student teacher ratio. So while some students might start, so what we did include in our presentation or in our application was sample class schedules. So if you start the day with Can I, I'm sorry, sure. thank you. I just trying to understand, you would operate both buildings yes. and that would allow you to essentially fully accommodate your enrollment, yes, sir. partly in Mount Vernon and partly in Johnson Square. Yes, sir. And so the, the economics of this is either you're renting space in the three-story building on in, in Mount Vernon. And purchasing space and, in Johnson Square. And purchasing space in Johnson Square and raising money to renovate those buildings to, to house the rest of your program. Yes, and what okay. we would like to do, we've got the proprietary program, the blocks that Baltimore Latin built. Uh -huh. A very core component to this is the design build concept. And as part of our outreach, we did commission or have the opportunity to go and talk with students, boys, at Johnston Square Elementary School. And Mr. Raymond Braxton, the principal of Johnston Square, is on our board. And also students at Empowerment Academy who could be potential students for our new school. So if it, they're not coming to you, we went out to the community to have conversations. The question that I asked these boys was, what would you want? If you had the ability to design a classroom space or a living space, what would this look like? And we've got renderings of buildings, one at 5837 Bel Air Road, and another one, and this is just par for the course with what we would do. The St. Paul Street building does not look like this currently, Commissioner. Yeah, it's very nice. So what happens is we got an architecture student who would essentially be using skills that we would want our students to have, and in less than 24 hours, I gave him some specifics he turned around these beautiful pictures. And this is what we would have an interest in our students having the capacity to do because it's transformative. And that's the architecture component that deals with STEM. So we would want our children to build out a space. So just imagine a blighted block. It's a blank canvas. And they're designing this over the course of their school careers. And that's, we've got a community engagement piece where we would take in thoughts from the community led by our founding families and our board members to discuss this. Thank you. Yes, sir. And we've also secured a letter of credit, and that's also included in our packet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you for Thank you. Us thank today. you for all the material. By Commissioner Hassan, second. Second by Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor? Uh, unanimously in favor of adjourning the charter work session, uh, 10 to 0, including our student commissioner. I'd now like to have a motion to open the public board meeting. 